by the request of Adonai and the board of Beth Amuna, I am delivering. Hello, microphone? Yes. This message about the day. The day today is known as Shabbat Chazon. It is because of the, um, the Haftarah that we have read from Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1 starts with the word Chazon Ishaya, the vision of Isaiah, Chazon Ishaya. Um, that's the verse 1. And, and, and that is after for today, which is a Shabbat before Tisha B'Av. Always called Shabbat Chazon, always this after is read. Also, interestingly enough, Deuteronomy 1 is read that Shabbat. Deuteronomy 1, always on Shabbat before Tisha B'Av. For those of you who don't know, Tisha B'Av is the ninth of Av. It's the day of the destruction of the temples uh, in Jerusalem. Uh, also, many other bad things happened for the Jewish people in history on that day. Some of them were timed specifically to that day to make it more painful. Like expulsion from Spain was timed to Tisha B'Av. It was not a coincidence. They timed it so. Uh, some of them were not timed to Tisha B'Av. Like World War I, probably they didn't time it to Tisha B'Av to start it and plunge the world into calamity. The first crusade started in Tisha B'Av. That's why, you know, any, any organization that ties their name to crusades, I don't think they know their history well, even though their intentions are good. <laughs> But they should kind of, you know, ask, ask the second question, not just the first. <laughs> but okay, it's neither here nor there. The bombing of the uh, Argentinian uh, cons uh, Jewish Community Center, I I IMA, happened to Shabbat in 1994, I think. Expulsion from Gaza of the Jewish people happened, was originally scheduled in Tishbab, but then they said, oh, well, we're done, let's move it one day. So they did it on the 10th. And now what happened today is a result of that. October 7th is a result of the withdrawal from Gaza in 2005. In their infinite wisdom, Israeli leaders have again proven. But okay, Shabbat Chazon. Literally, though, means Shabbat of a vision. Chazon is a vision, prophetic vision. What type of vi vision? Because it's a book of Isaiah, right? But, but, even, but speaking... I suppose, um, I mean, allegorically, by picking that name, the, the rabbis wanted perhaps to say something, because what kind of vision does that Shabbat convey? It's, of course, it's a vision into Tisha B'Av. It's a vision into something that, that have transpired. It's not being inside a Tisha B'Av, but it's like kind of a vision of it, being a bit remote from it. What is a Tisha B'Av vision of? Of course, it's the vision of, uh, of, of, not, of a destruction. It's a vision of what, what is not there. What is not there is the temple. The temple is not there. So Shabbat Azon is a vision of something that's not there. What is it likened to? It is likened to a bridegroom that went away after proposing, after engaging to, to his bride and delivering her the, the ring and, and, a, and a, a agreement and arrangement of the engagement, he, and he then departs to build a house for them to live in together. But in the meantime, while he's away, the bride is unfaithful to him, and he finds out. Exactly. What does he do? Well, he has to try. He has an option. He can break the engagement or not. But he loves her, but he can't leave it that way. What does he do? What he does is that he shows her this beautiful home that he built for them to dwell in together, to live together. He burns it up. And he burns it, and she is watching. That is the vision, saying that's what your unfaithfulness have caused. Is that our house that we are to live together? Gone. You know, that's why 
the rebuilding of the house can only commence by the one who destroyed it. She cannot go away, go and rebuild that house herself. She doesn't have that power. He needs to rebuild it. That's why any rebuilding of the house of the temple happens only by the command of God through the prophets. Like the second temple was rebuilt by the mouth of the prophets that were there, Zechariah, Haggai, and Mal- Zechariah, Zechariah and Haggai. And the third temple perhaps will also be rebuilt by the mouth of the prophets. That's why there's no rebuilding. They say, why didn't you rebuild the third temple? Why didn't you rebuild the third temple? Only a prophet can direct the rebuilding of that. Some Jewish people, uh, religious, take it even further, saying only the prophet can actually ordain the uh, establishment of the state of Israel. That's why they don't support it, but it's a fringe. You know, that's, that's not very much supported. I don't go by that. But the temple is a different thing. So, and Isaiah, in, in chapter 1 of Isaiah, when, 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 he, when it starts with Chazon, Chazon Ishaya, he goes on and he actually quotes or ref- refers to Deuteronomy, the book of Deuteronomy. Like, book of Isaiah has a lot of allusions to Deuteronomy. Even the beginning, it says in Isaiah 1 2, it says, Shimu Shamayim Vahazina Aretz. Vahazinu Aretz. This is, the, this is a, 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 an allusion to the Song of Moses, known as Hazinu in Deuteronomy 32, which starts with Hazinu Hashemayim Yidaberu Vitishmah Aretz in Repi. Like, give ear or heaven, and I will speak and listen the earth to my to the voice of my mouth. Same thing, Isaiah says, listen, listen heaven and give ear earth. It reverses it. So he quotes from Deuteronomy, and the chapter 1 of Isaiah is a rebuke. We, we, we have heard what was read today. It's a rebuke. It's an indictment to the, gener- to the wicked generation. And, and the Deuteronomy is also a rebuke. It, it start, like the, from the first war- verse of Deuteronomy, it is a rebuke. Because what's the first, first verse? These are the words that God spoken to Moses in, in this particular location. And in the next verse, verse 2, it says, 11-day journey is from Mount Horeb, from Mount Horeb until, until the land of Israel. And the next verse, in the 40th year, <laughs> meaning what? It only should take you 11 days, guys. It took you 40 years. What's wrong with you? And, and it is actually seen... Uh, traditionally, that the return of the spies, or if you know the spies, went, the cause of them being there for 40 years is the spies who brought the bad report about they badmouthed the land and uh, caused Jewish people to lose heart. They didn't enter. The day when the spies return, if you just go literally by the dates mentioned in the Torah in the book of Numbers, falls on the Tisha B'Av. That's the day of their return. Because why? Because they leave in the in the, uh, um, where is it? They leave on the second day of the, oh, the, I'm sorry, on the 20th day of the second month, they leave, then they go for three days, that's the 23rd, then they stay there for a month, that's the third of, 23rd of the third month, then there is Miriam, that is a leper for seven days, that's the 30th day of the, of the third month, then they send the spies plus 40 days, that's the 10, ninth day of the fifth month, which is the Tisha So if you add them all up, I mean, who knows? Maybe there are days in between. I don't know. But these are the only days we got. And these are the only, the only measurements of time we got. So Deuteronomy starts with the rebuke like that, ends with the rebuke of the song of Moses, because song of Moses is a rebuke as well. If you go through it, you can, it's, just, it's, it's a song that testifies, saying all these things will happen. And you ask why this is happening, because they've been written already. But it also, of course, ends with a blessing. It doesn't end with rebuke. It ends with a blessing. It ends with the Zot HaBrocha, the, 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 the book of Deuteronomy. Isaiah starts with the rebuke, as we have read. I'm going to read again. This is verse 13, 13, 15. Chapter 1, verses 13 through 15. It says, bring no more worthless offerings. Increase in abomin- is an, incre- incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Shabbat, Rosh Chodesh and Shabbat, the calling of convocations, I cannot endure it. Iniquity with solemn assembly, so on and so forth. It says, when you multiply prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. That's the beginning of the book of Isaiah. Stark rebuke to that generation. 
But Isaiah, and Isaiah ends, though, on, on the note of hope. It ends in chapter 66. Interesting, because Isaiah is divided into parts. For the first, chapter 1 through 39, of chapter is more of a rebuke. And the second part, 40 through 66, are more of consolation. And the, Shabbat, the, the coming Shabbat is, is known as Shabbat Nachamu. And Isaiah 40 is read to start Nachamu, Nachamu, I me comfort, comfort my people. So Isaiah is also like kind of divided into, into these two parts. And it ends on a high note. It's Isaiah 66, 22. It says, For just as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make will endure before me, it is declared of the Lord, so your descendants and your name will endure, and it will come to pass that from one new moon to another, from Rosh Chodesh to another Rosh Chodesh, from one Shabbat to another. Remember, first he didn't want Shabbats and Rosh Chodesh. In the beginning of Isaiah, I don't want your Shabbat and Rosh Chodesh. Now he says, okay, you will come from Shabbat to Shabbat to Rosh Chodesh to Rosh Chodesh. Says, Every flesh will come, bow down to me, says the Lord. That doesn't end there. There's another verse. As they leave, they will look on the corpses of the people who rebelled against me, for their worm will not die and their fire will not be quenched. Sounds familiar, right? <laughs> familiar verse, this is where it's from. And they will be a horror to all flesh. That's the end of Isaiah. It ends with a blessing, but uh, what? All these things happen. All of these horrors have come upon us. The question is how? Did it happen? Well, that's the, that's the question that the, that the book that is read on Tisha B'Av, the Lamentations of Jeremiah, is officially known in Hebrew as the book of Eicha. It, Eicha means how. That's the first word of the book. It says, how desolate lies the city. So the question is how. How did it happen? How is the city so desolate? The city that was so full of people now lie desolate. What happened to it? The same word, how, and the same concept is repeated in Isaiah for, uh, chapter 1, verse 21, what we read today as well. It says, how the faithful city has become a harlot. She that was full of justice, righteousness, lodged in her, now murders. That same word, how, appears in Deuteronomy chapter 1 that we read today. Moses says in verse... Chapter 1, verse 12, how can I bear your load, your burden, the strife by myself? He says, and says, okay, I can't appoint the elders, and it sounds like a good idea, right? And then those people, they came to him saying, send the spies. It also sounded like a good idea. So it all was downhill from there. The sin of the spies it all started when they were... Bad-mouthing the land, didn't want to come, back, come in because of the fear. I understand. But then Isaiah speaks about that city saying it's full of murder. Some spies to murderers, that's a long way, it seems like. But wasn't that the same progression in the Garden of Eden? Where Adam and Eve, they did not want to stay in the garden for some reason. They chose not to stay and leave the place. You know, when, when the spies go in, Moses charges them, is there a tree there in the land? Not trees. Is there a tree? He said. And bring the fruits. <laughs> the land is likened to the Garden of Eden. They spurned the land, just like first man spurned the garden. And the next thing you know, his kids killing each other. Well, not each other. It's not a... <laughs> One kills another. <laughs> One of his kid, kids kill another, and there is a murder. You know, m murder is the worst sin there is. Why? Because you can't fix it. Like all the other sins you probably can fix, murder you cannot fix. You can repent of it, but you can't fix it. So that's why it's the worst thing. You know, in Matthew, when Yeshua speaks, what, was, what we read today, the Olivet Discourse, when Yeshua speaks about the destruction, chapter 24 of Matthew, what precedes it in chapter 23, it says this. It says, because, because of this, behold, I'm sending you prophets, wise men and Torah scholars, says Yeshua to the people. Some of them you will kill and execute at the stake. Some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city. And so upon you shall come all the righteous blood shed on earth from the blood of righteous Abel. Okay, <laughs> for some reason, to the blood of Zechariah, whom you murdered between temple and altar. 
Amen, I tell you, all these things will come upon this generation. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and, sto and stones those who send to her. How often <laughs> I long to gather your children together as hen gathers her cheeks under her wings, but you were unwilling. Look, vision, look at your house. Look, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will never see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You know, when the disciples of John and the Pharisees, they came to the disciples of Yeshua and, and they asked, should, why aren't you fasting? You know, Tisha B'Av is a fast day. You know, should we fast on Tisha B'Av? Because, you know, we, we know we have, we don't need a temple. We know that the forgiveness of sins does not come from the temple sacrifices, from sin sacrifices. We know that the forgiveness of sin comes through the sacrifice of Mashiach. So we don't need that. So you know, why, do we, why, why should we mourn at the destruction of the temple? Why should we fast? And so disciples of the Pharisees and, and John, they come to Yeshua and said, Does your, why don't you fast? Because they were not, they're not fasting because of the temple, Tisha B'Av. They were not fasting. They were, it wasn't, they, that was not the context. But he says this, Yeshua said to them, You cannot make guests of the bridegroom fast while bridegroom is with them, can you? So bridegroom didn't go yet to build that house. But the days will come, and when the bridegroom is taken away from them, then they will fast in those days. When bridegroom is not here. So, and, and it, was, it was the question also that the elders were sent to, in the time when the first temple was being rebuilt, the elders went to Zechariah the prophet, not the one they murdered, the other Zechariah. Zechariah the prophet, they went to him and they asked him th that same question, should we fast on Tisha B'Av? It's Zechariah 7, they came to him and they asked, uh, say, saying, should we mourn and consecrate ourselves in the fifth month as we have done so for, for so many years? Zechariah 7, 3. That's the Tisha B'Av, basically, should we fast on Tisha B'Av? Asked, asked the, the, the messengers that were sent to Zechariah. And Zechariah basically, God said to, to tell him that, if you read those chapters, who you fast for, who you don't fast for, just do acts of righteousness. And when you do acts of righteousness, all these fasts, it says Zechariah 8, 18, it says, Again, the word of the Lord came, the Lord of hosts came saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the fast of the fourth, the fast, fast of the fifth, the fast of the seventh, the fast of the tenth month will be joy, gladness, and cheerful holidays. Therefore, love, truth, and shalom. If you do these things, all these fasts will turn to holidays to you. Then again, God will accept. Because what? Because all of these fasts caused us to change our ways, caused us to get our act together and, and act justly and righteously. Our people Israel, that is. And, and, and all, all the other people as well. Our state, the state of our people is today as such as described in Lamentations 2.9 about Jerusalem. It says, her gates have sunk to the ground. He has destroyed and broken her bars. Her king and her princes are among the nations. The law, the Torah is no more. And her prophets find no vision from the Lord. It says, Gam neviim lo matzanu chazon me'adonai. There's no chazon, there's no vision to rebuild the presence, to rebuild Yerushalayim. Zechariah had a vision of the rebuilding of the temple, the prophet Zechariah. He saw the, the two olive trees, he saw the menorah, he said, well, he tells, not by might, not by power, but by the spirit, says the Lord of hosts. This is, this is the word of the Lord to, to Zerubbabel, the one who's going to be in charge of rebuilding the temple. And Zerubbabel and Yehoshua, the high priest, together they rebuilt the, the, the temple by the words of the prophets, by the word of prophet of Ze Zechariah and Haggai. These are the, the two olive trees that are also seen in the book of Revelation, chapter 11, the reference to the two olive trees, the two witnesses that stand in the courts of the temple, Perhaps they will be the ones who announce the rebuilding of the temple. I don't know. We don't know. We will see. But even if they do, even if the temple is destroyed, rebuilt, <laughs> even if the temple is rebuilt, 
Is it a cause of celebration? I, what good is the house if it's empty? What good is the, is the palace if the king is not in it? It's a museum. It's like in the, you know, in Europe, all these palaces in Europe, well, I guess in England they have a king, but, but that, you know, is not a real king. I mean, <laughs> he just cuts ribbons. <laughs> God bless him. Um, I'm talking about the real king, king that has the power. Real king is a king with the power. A king without power is not a king, I'm sorry. So, we fast now, I say, because the bridegroom has been taken from us. We don't have a bridegroom now, so we do fast. We fast also, and maybe even, even more so, it's because our people are not recognizing him as such. And before they do, he is not coming back. It says, Yerushalayim, Jerusalem will not see him again before it says, Baruch HaBab Hashem Adonai. So we fast and we mourn this fact that our people are far away and we are continuing to experience breach after breach after breach. And the October 7th just happened and it's another breach. And how long are we going to eat that? And we're going to eat that until we come back and we call upon his name. And we mourn this fact that our people are so far. You know, you ask why the temple is destroyed. You ask traditionally, the answer will be because of the baseless hatred. The second te first temple was destroyed because of adultery, adultery, murder, all the bad sins. Second temple was destroyed because of baseless hatred, sinat chinam. And you know, if you think about it, sinat chinam, is, yeah, it's, it's not a good thing. It's, ba it's bad to hate people. It's even worse to hate people baselessly. But to destroy the temple and have it not rebuilt for 2,000 years, that seems too harsh. When it's not too harsh, when that baseless hatred is towards the Mashiach, the king, and you kill the Mashiach, then it's not too harsh. Then maybe it's not even, you know, maybe it's, it's deserves forever and ever if it wasn't for the grace of God. And Yeshua says so himself. He says in John 15, 23, he says this, He who hates me also hates my father. If I had done, not done works among them, that no one else did, they would not, they would have no sin. But now they have seen, have seen, they have vision, and have hated both me and my father. So it is fulfilled the word written in the scripture, they hated me baselessly. When the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he'll testify about me, and you will also testify because you have been with me from the beginning. The testimony that we have today is the New Testament. That is the testimony that they have testified with. We have the testimony. We have the New Testament. And, and Yeshua was talking to them again in this discourse, saying, now you see me, then you won't. And then he says in, in chapter 16, John 16, 19, he goes on and says, Yeshua knew that they wanted to question him. So he said to them, are you asking each other about this that I said a little while and you will no longer see me? And again, a little while you will see me. It's like, you see me and you don't. What's that? What does he mean? Right? A man, a man, I tell you, you will weep and mourn. And the world will celebrate. You'll be filled with sorrow. But will so your sorrow will turn to joy. What would turn their sorrow to joy? It's the rebuilding of the body of the Messiah. It says, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up. It's the resurrection that turned their mourning into joy. New Testament, New Testament is the testimony of the joy of the resurrection. It has mourning in it of what had happened, but it also contains the joy that, that all of that has been reversed and restored. And therefore, the day, the day that was supposed to be the day of mourning, turned to them to a day of joy and gladness. They saw and written it. 
we believe what they have said. We believe their testimony by faith and by the Holy Spirit that is given to us. For the testimony of Yeshua is the spirit of prophecy. This is what is to be conveyed to our people. Is it information only? You know, after the October 7th, when the joy of the Simcha Torah was turned into mourning, are we to give the Jewish people or people information saying, if, that wouldn't have, if you wouldn't believe that wouldn't have happened? You know, is that what it was supposed to do? Go around saying these things? It may be true, but that's not how you go about these things. You're not going to get anywhere with this type of, <laughs> type of messaging. You have to recalibrate the message. It's not just the message of rebuke, but it's also a message of hope. John 16, a little earlier, 8 through 11, it says, When he comes, the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict the world about sin, righteousness, and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I'm going to the Father and you will no longer see me. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. That's a cryptic verse. Why these three things? What does it mean? He'll convict the world of sin because they did not believe. You know, how is that? How would it convict the world of sin because they didn't believe? Because look, there's no temple. How did that happen? It happened. How did we miss him? It's because of our sin. We have missed him. Because there is no temple, he convicts the world of sin. He will convict the world of righteousness because he's going to the Father. We no longer see him. There's no vision. We don't see him, but who do we see? Who does the world see? The world sees the disciples of Yeshua who then show his righteousness as was said during the homily, we, the world should see the righteousness of Mashiach through the acts of his disciples. And that's how the wor world is convicted about the righteousness. That righteousness is achievable. It is achievable. But it's only achievable through Mashiach because it is him only who imputes that righteousness to his followers. And about judgment. Because the ruler of this world is judged. How is the, he judged? Because he couldn't hold Mashiach in the chain of death. He did not have a right to that. He was judged because he unjustly killed him. And in that judgment, what awaits the ruler of the world is the lake of fire, where the worm never dies and the fire never quenches. It's these things that we testify while we also fast and mourn the disbelief of our people. We rejoice, but we also mourn. The time will come when we stop mourning altogether. But at the same time, it's not yet. And while our hope is alive and our mourning is not without hope, we still mark the day. Because that's what, it's a reminder of my, our people being far away today. Without vision, the people perish. Or become un, unrestrained. Without vision, people become unrestrained. Without the vision of the Mashiach, that is. It starts with the vision of the destroyed temple. But it doesn't have to end there. It is up to us to bring the vision of hope and a testimony of Mashiach Yeshua 
through the words of the prophecy. That's what for us is a Tisha B'Av. There is hope in our mourning. And there's no other hope. Father in heaven, I pray that we'll be given platform and authority to speak into the ears of our people, Israel, primarily. Also, all those who wants to hear, but it is Israel who needs to say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord for the Messiah to return. We go for a big prize. We pray, Father, that we'll be successful in what we do. We pray, Father, that you'll give us a platform and the opportunity to speak the words of the Besarot Tavot, of the good news, into the ears of your people Israel unrestrained. Because we do have a vision, and we don't need that vision to be restrained. We need that vision to be conveyed. It will not tear, tarry. It will come exactly when it needs to, but we pray, Father, for it to hasten. We pray, Father, for the salvation of your people Israel to hasten. Because until when will our people be breached in such a way, generation after generation, time after time, the enemy rises in every generation, Father. Father, it's time for it to stop. It's been too long. We pray, Father, that you will empower your people the pray for the messianic judaism to to be the head and not the tail of the jewish people to be able to speak with boldness and con- clarity and conviction so that the good news that is proclaimed to the ears of the jewish people is a jewish message that it's not the message of the crusades but it's the message of the besorah of the of the scripture of israel spoken the voice of israel with the voice of Yaakov. And pray, Father, for speedy salvation of your people Israel, even now. In Yeshua's name. Amen.